Now it's a great pleasure to make a, a look forward in the future or in the in actually the next big thing in open source. And we thought in the program committee, how can we do that? What's the next big thing? And that's why we actually um, found Luis. And Luis is one of the one of the main brains of Hugging Face. Who of you has heard of Hugging Face? Ah, okay, some of the specialists have, so that's a fantastic company you're working at. Um, you're doing fant great machine learning things, and the, the great part of it, it's most of it is open source, and you're actually building a new GitHub for open source machine learning models, and I'm really fascinated, and it's a great honor to have you here. So welcome to our... Um, traditionary um, community and we are now very much looking forward to the future of open source. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Matthias, and uh, thank you very much for having me here. I apologize that I, I don't yet speak Bandwitch. Um, my son is two years old and every day comes with new words I don't understand. So maybe by, maybe by next year, um, if I'm back here, then I can um, say something like Grüß dich and <laughs> everything will be clearer. Um, so today I'd like to talk a little bit about um, open source from a slightly different perspective. Um, so I think most people here are quite familiar with open source software, open data. And um, at Hugging Face, we're building a, a platform and a community around open source machine learning. And this poses a set of kind of different challenges and different risks um, that are uh, kind of interesting to talk about. And in particular, I'd like to talk a little bit about, um, you know, how does it mean to do sort of science or research um, fully in the open? Because the current climate is dominated by big tech like Google and Facebook. And so we're trying to sort of find a, an alternative approach where the community can really get together and build the tools um, of the future. So why all the fuss about machine learning? Um, if you're on Twitter or on Reddit, um, you may have seen that your timelines have been flooded by synthetic images like this one. So this is um, a very recent um, model or um, machine learning model that has been released open source um, where you provide text and it generates uh, these images. So here I provided a text which says a photograph of an astronaut riding a horse and then the model generates this completely fictitious astronaut riding a horse. And you can do this for many things, whatever your kind of creative mind comes up with. And this is the sort of, let's say, the start of a kind of new potential revolution in the way we do creative work as humans, because you no longer need to study for 10 years doing art school to build impressive uh, things like this. You can actually just use your, your language um, to sort of guide um, the, the machine learning models to, to produce what you want. So. The kind of start of this revolution um, actually happened a few years ago. Um, so around 2017, uh, Google open sourced um, a, a very popular type of neural network, um, which is a form of artificial intelligence called the transformer. And this um, kind of launched a whole revolution in the way that we process language. So you can see in this example here, um, Microsoft um, for many years was um, adding languages to their translation service. And it was kind of like linear growth um, until around 2017 or maybe 2019 here, where they integrated this, this new um, sort of neural network into their system. And so they were suddenly able to almost double the number of languages they had over the space of two years than all the previous years before. And so this kind of revolution or this kind of progress is not just in, in products that we use on every day, um, but it's also happening in all through academia. So there are many kind of benchmarks that academics um, use to sort of assess how good um, an artificial intelligence system is. And kind of consistently, you see this kind of big uh, growth in performance and how kind of capable um, these, new, these new types of systems are. And obviously since then, all these kind of big tech companies have been um, utilizing this to kind of make their own products um, more intelligent. And for example, Google um, a couple of years ago mentioned that integrating this new transformer into their search engine 
was the biggest leap forward in the past five years and one of the biggest leap forward in the history of their search. And if you think about how optimized Google search is, this is a fairly big statement uh, for them to be making. And it's not just um, language and search and kind of the conventional products that we deal with on a day to day. Um, there's companies like DeepMind, which have done enormous progress in um, using artificial intelligence to kind of further science. And just last year, they um, uh, discussed and open sourced something called AlphaFold, which is a way of modeling protein sequences um, in a way that was a dramatic breakthrough compared to the previous, you know, 10, roughly 10 years um, in this type of task. So to give you an idea of what's kind of happening here, I'm not going to have any jargon or equations, so don't worry. Um, but the basic idea is that um, the reason why this is such a, a big change in the way that we build machine learning systems is that in the kind of old days, you had to train one model for every single type of task you were trying to solve. So if you were, for example, trying to build something that could classify sentiment of movie reviews, you would train one model for that. And then if you wanted to, for example, understand clinical texts, you would have to build a different model for that. And this transformer has essentially opened up a different way of um, creating machine learning systems where you train one base model or foundation model on a huge amount of data, whether it's text or images or videos. And then that single model can be adapted to many independent downstream tasks. And this is much more efficient than training everything from scratch because we essentially have now a system where we can use unlabeled data and um, get high performance systems with much less um, human annotation. So the way these models are built um, is you take some huge amount of data, whether it's text, as I said, or images or speech data, um, you train one of these kind of foundation or pre-trained models, and then you'll typically need a large amount of compute power um, for this to, to, to work. Um, we're talking like at the scale of data centers, you're going to need months usually on hundreds of GPUs. And then at the end of this, you have a model now that can be adapted into many um, different types of tasks, as I was mentioning. And also, as I just mentioned before, the performance is usually very high and much higher than all previous methods um, that have existed um, in, in computer science. So just to give you a taste of, of what I mean by tasks and applications, um, in the context of natural language processing, um, here we have an example where we provide um, the model uh, with some snippet of text, and we can ask questions about this. So for example, here I've copy-pasted something about Marie Curie from the Nobel Prize um, citation, and then you can ask, for example, you know, when did Marie Curie win the Nobel Prize? And the model will scan through this text and extract um, the date for you. And you can understand a little bit why this is like a powerful way of processing text because we can ask many different types of questions and the model can then extract these answers for us which we can then feed into databases or into other applications. And the same is also true if we take that same piece of text and we provide now, um, we ask the model to tell us what are the entities in that text. So can you tell us which parts of the text correspond to people, to locations, um, other types of entities, and then the model will automatically extract that. Now, everything I said was just about NLP, but it turns out that um, this transformer um, architecture, this transformer neural network, can also be applied to computer vision. And so in this example here, we provide an image of a cute little dog, and then the model predicts, for example, it's an Eskimo, um, or in the case of the beetles, we can ask it to extract all the objects in this picture. So the main thing here is that there's a diverse range of tasks where as humans, we can, we can sit down and we can do them ourselves. Like I can sit down and draw boxes around all, the, all these people. But with machine learning, we can do this in an automated way or almost semi-automated way, which opens up a whole new type of applications, um, which kind of alleviates the sort of you know, human uh, need to, to manually intervene on all these tasks. And then the more recent one is what I was started with this talk with was, you know, combining multiple things together, like multiple modalities. So combining images and text and potentially even audio, that's probably going to come soon this year, and use these different uh, sort of types of input data to generate new kind of creative outputs. So all of this stuff is like exciting, or I hope it's exciting. Um, and it's likely going to uh, sort of change the way we build software um, in the coming years. I would say for the next generation, like my son, he's going to grow up in a world where almost every application will have some element of machine learning integrated into it. 
And the, the sort of big challenge here is, is how do we um, make sure that this technology isn't just centralized among a few big companies? So to the credit of companies like Google and Facebook, they have open sourced a large number um, of the models that um, are behind the technology I showed you before. Um, and many researchers um, on a sort of daily basis are publishing papers which also come with the code and the accompanying models and the data sets used to train them. So in some sense today, the challenge we have is an embarrassment of riches. We have huge numbers of models to choose from, huge numbers of data sets. And so the kind of first challenge is how do you navigate this very large space um, if you're just like a software engineer who wants to you know, figure out how do I solve my particular problem. Now, the other problem is that even though open source is great, um, a lot of the open source in machine learning is um, kind of research code. So these are like PhD students or um, grad students at universities. And you know, their core business is not you know, writing software, it's writing papers. And so if you look at a lot of these very popular uh, machine learning uh, repositories on GitHub, you'll have people complaining like, hey, you wrote it in Python 2, come on, like this is the 21st century, or you know, why is there no documentation and so on. So this makes it very hard for the sort of general public to be able to use these models because you have this sort of very incompatible set of um, like code bases, missing documentation, and so on. So the kind of question that we ask ourselves at Hugging Face is, can we do things in a slightly better way, or even in a much better way? And the, the approach that we have is to take um, all of this amazing development that's happening around open source machine learning. So for example, there are um, libraries that are coming from Google, like Keras, Jax, PyTorch is from Facebook. And to find a way to kind of systematically organize all of the, um, the models that are associated with these libraries into a single platform. So the platform we have is called the Hugging Face Hub. And this has um, basically three main components that I'll, I'll briefly summarize. We have a way of kind of collecting models that people can use uh, for free, um, data sets, and then spaces, which is a way of sort of showing and building machine learning applications um, for the general public. So the first challenge is how do you gather um, this huge number of models? Um, at the moment, we have 70,000 models um, on this Hugging Face Hub, um, spanning things like computer vision, natural language processing, and reinforcement learning. And of these, there are around 10,000 of these pre-trained or foundation models I was alluding to, which can then be used for many different downstream tasks. So the standard place here is to sort of search for the type of task you're interested in, and then adapt it on your own type of data. And another kind of missing thing that we identified in the community was this issue of documentation. So a lot of source code um, you'll, you'll find generally has good documentation, but what does it mean to document a, a machine learning model or a data set? So um, some of the people at Hugging Face, they've pioneered this use of what are called model cards. And the idea here is that when you release an open source a model, you should provide information not just about what that model, model does, but how it was trained, what kind of ethical implications it may have, um, does, it, was it, does it have any sort of biases that it learned from the data. Um, and we also provide kind of interactive widgets that allow people to just quickly type uh, a bit of text and see you know, what kind of outputs that model makes. And the same is also true for data sets. So we have a, a very active community that is um, continually adding new data sets uh, to the hub. And again, we have a sort of simple or single API which allows you to load any one of these data sets with essentially one line of Python. And this standardization aspect is one element of what we think is important to sort of bring some structure into open source ML um, so that you don't have to keep switching across frameworks um, every time you want to, for example, use a different data set. And the third element is that you know, machine learning models and data sets are like exciting if you're a researcher or if you're you know, a hacker. Um, but the truth is the vast majority of the world that is impacted by machine learning um, is, n is not uh, this, this type of developer. It's uh, people like you know, my parents, my brothers, ultimately my son. And we need a way to provide interfaces between the, the power of what these models can do um, to the general public. And so we've um, created a, an aspect of our platform which lets people use open source tools like Streamlit and Gradio and then deploy these applications um, onto the hub. So you can, for example, you know, provide a picture of Elon Musk and then instantly kind of turn it into a cartoon. 
And this idea here is to allow the general public to interact with these models and then provide feedback and say, hey, this model has some problematic issues or you know, I could improve it in this other way. Um, and we found that this ability to provide visual interfaces is a very important um, way in kind of educating the general public about both the power of what machine learning can do, but also the limitations. So I'd like to sort of um, end by talking a little bit about the future of where the field is going. So I've kind of given you a quick summary of all these different applications. Um, but you know, machine learning is not a silver bullet. Um, and there are many open challenges uh, in the field. So the first one is how do we handle like low resource languages? And what I mean by this are languages that are not well represented on the internet. So most of these um, you know, powerful models, they're typically very biased towards English, uh, Hochdeutsch, French, all the kind of languages you can easily scrape from the internet. But if you want to have something that is really good at say Romansh or Swiss German, which you know, is not even unique in some sense because of all the different dialects, you're gonna have a very, very hard time building something that can translate, for example, across these languages. The other element is that um, all of these models, they inherently pick up biases from the data they're trained on. So if your data has, for example, an overrepresentation of men as CEOs or women as nurses, these models will learn those patterns. And then if you then propagate that down into your applications, that can have a feedback loop, which can be negative for, for society. Um, the other element is combining multiple um, modalities. And what I mean by modality is these different types of data, so text, images, um, and audio. And the reason for this is that it's an open conjecture in the field whether combining multiple sort of sensory inputs um, will ultimately lead to some sort of more generally capable systems. And the jury's out on that, but um, this is likely to be where we will see some big um, changes in the coming year. And the one I want to sort of focus on for the last few minutes um, is what are called huge models. So I mentioned briefly at the start that you need a large amount of um, data, a large amount of compute to build one of these like foundation models. Um, and this graph here shows you um, on the x-axis um, time since 2010 and on the y-axis um, what are called petaflops. So how many kind of operations do you need or floating point operations do you need to, to train one of these models? And the, the sort of big models that were open sourced a few years ago um, by uh, Google was BERT uh, Large. And you can see this was you know, roughly 100,000 uh, petaflops required to train it. Um, and since then, it's grown exponentially. So this is on a, on a log scale. So you know, in the time from BERT Large to now, we're now looking at like a billion uh, petaflops needed to train one of these you know, big foundation models. And this, at the moment, all of these models are sort of only in the domain of big companies like you know, Google and Facebook who have the computational resources uh, to do this. And the reason why they're investing so much in that is that it's been um, discovered that as you increase the sort of capacity of your models and you train them on these very large uh, data sets, the capabilities uh, increase uh, quite dramatically. So the way this works is that um, in traditional machine learning, I have to sort of train a model um, on a particular data set and then it's kind of fixed to that type of data set. But it turns out if you train models with progressively larger amounts of parameters or capacity, then they're able to generalize across completely unseen tasks, which means you can essentially have something like a kind of uh, an oracle that you can talk to and say, hey, um, can you solve this math problem? And it may have never seen that math problem. And you know, to some degree of accuracy, um, these models can solve it. But this phenomenon only happens once you have a very, very large model um, and you need a large amount of compute to train it. And another example is in these kind of image generation models. You can see that um, if you give uh, one of these uh, models a uh, text which says a portrait of a kangaroo wearing a hoodie, sunglasses in front of the Sydney house, holding a sign on the chest that says, welcome friends. I mean, very specific, but you know, I'm from Australia, so this is you know, dear to my heart. You can see that in the, um, here we're talking about millions of parameters and then billions. And you can see that when the model only has 300 million parameters, it can't really write welcome friends on the sign. But then as you increase the sort of capacity of these, these models, you start getting you know, something like welcome friend, and then suddenly at 20 billion parameters, actually welcome friends, and the, car and the kangaroo really is rendered in, in high detail. 
So there's this general pattern that we need to make larger models, so we need more compute and more data. Um, but the problem is that at the moment, this is really only in the hands of a few large tech companies. So all of these very powerful and large models here, um, they're, they're produced by typically Google and Meta and uh, OpenAI. Um, but they have the downside, which is that they're usually blocked. So they either never release the model, they just release a, a fancy blog post, um, or they have an API which you can pay for and you can interact with, but you have no idea like really how the model was trained. You can't interact, you can't change it. You can, you're just sort of stuck with what they provide. And the other element is that from just a scientific angle, um, these things are very hard to reproduce. You're just sort of told, hey, here's our results, take them on faith. But from a sort of scientist, scientific perspective, you would like to have something that is reproducible. So at Hugging Face, we saw this trend um, was, was evolving from less open source uh, towards more closed source. So we tried to um, change this uh, pattern. And uh, for that reason, about a year ago, we started something called the Big Science Project, um, which was this ambitious uh, project to bring together hundreds of um, researchers all across the world to train one of these very large models. And so we're talking about training a model that has you know, billions of parameters. And the, the basic idea was to do this completely in the open. So everything open source, like no like sort of secret meetings or anything, everything was discussed basically on GitHub. Um, and the result of this was uh, training one of these very large scale models on a French supercomputer for around three and a half months. And the novelty here is that all of those previous models were monolingual. They were trained only for English data because again, these companies tend to be mostly concentrated in America. And in this case, we decided to train something in 46 different languages to try and cover as much as we could of, of the spoken world. Um, and also 13 programming languages. So this model can not only generate text in, in different languages, it can also generate code. And here's a small example where you provide um, some input in French. You say, you know, this is a French translation, and then you can get it to translate into Spanish. And just with that instruction of the task, it then automatically generates uh, the Spanish translation. And the exciting aspect of this is that um, this was like a kind of proof of existence. You know, you can actually do this with a relatively small team. So there was only roughly maybe seven to ten people from Hugging Face really driving this community of, of you know, 700 different researchers. Um, and this seems to have inspired other companies now to, to take a similar approach. So all of these like funny generations that I've showed you of images, they're coming from something called Stable Diffusion, which was open sourced just two weeks ago. Um, but also Meta AI uh, recently said that they're going to open source one of their very large models. And there's also a, a community called Eleuther AI, um, which are very focused now on reproducing and open sourcing um, a lot of these powerful uh, systems. So with that, I'd like to say thank you for listening to me. This is uh, an image where I said a photograph of a, cl a cow climbing the Matterhorn. And, you know, the Matterhorn isn't quite perfect, but it looks good enough. So thank you once again. <laughs>